Hello, welcome to the Disruptive by Design podcast. I'm Kimberly Underwood, Director of Digital News Media at FCA International Signal Media. Signal Media is the official news outlet of FCA, in case you didn't know. And thanks for turning in as we speak with leaders under 40 years of age across the military, industry, and academia. And these Disruptive by Design emerging leaders will share their experiences as they navigate the world of information technology, military systems, and intelligence. In this episode, I get to speak with Michael Weigand, who is kind of a rock star. He is the chief growth officer and co-founder of a company called Shift5. And he's a West Point graduate who was an airborne ranger qualified infantry officer, and then was selected to be one of the first cyber operations officers in the army, and then was one of the 40, or I was going to say first, 40 founding members of Army Cyber Command. He was uh, just awarded our 40 Under 40 Award at our recent TechNet Cyber Conference in Baltimore. And uh, despite all of his experience, um, he is a humble guy. And I thought it was very interesting how he wanted to go to West Point and didn't get in initially. So he worked hard at the New Mexico Military Institute as a ROTC cadet and then was accepted and then kind of took off from there. And now as an entrepreneur, he'll talk about Shift5, the company he co-founded and its unique name, and he'll offer his experiences and advice. Thanks for tuning in. Maybe we could start out and you could tell us a little bit about yourself, Mike. Yeah, so um, good afternoon. My name is Michael Wiggins. Uh, let's see a little about myself. <laughs> Um, let's see, prior to becoming an entrepreneur, I was an army officer and, uh, you know, something that's really exciting about, I think, joining the military these days is there's been so much transformation in, uh, you know, in the defense industry and in the world in the last, uh, you know, two decades that I joined the military at the perfect time when an infantry officer could become a cyber officer. And that's my story. I actually commissioned out of West Point with a degree in computer science in 2011. And I served for a few years as a uh, infantry platoon leader and an executive officer of a, you know, a heavy unit. We had uh, Bradleys and Abrams and, and uh, you know, all kinds of armor. Um, I served with the, uh, the first cavalry division uh, down in Texas at Fort Hood. Uh, but as the cyber branch was established in 2014, they were looking for, um, you know, officers to help uh, staff it and stand it up. And so I was uh, very fortunate to be one of the first, uh, you know, 40 some odd officers that helped establish the uh, the cyber branch within the Army, which was the first branch established since, I think, Special Forces decades ago. Um, so it was a really exciting time to uh, to be in the military and, and something that's really shaped my views entering business and now, uh, you know, serving in um, uh, in the cyber and uh, and defense industries, but, um, you know, wearing a, uh, you know, a collared shirt and slacks instead of a, a camouflage uniform. Right, right. Sure. And how did you know you wanted to study computer science at West Point? And, and at that point, had you already thought you might go into cyber or were you just interest, interested in, in coding and computer science? Well, I was always something of a little bit of a, a geek or a nerd. Um, at a very young age, I was constantly getting in trouble for disassembling my toys. Um, I remember uh, my parents one year bought me, you know, this really cool remote control like fire truck. And within about three days, I had found a screwdriver and had completely disassembled it. Um, I could never quite get everything to go back together and work, uh, you know, uh, like it was. But I took some computer science classes in in high school, and um, I did a year stint uh, between high school and West Point at a at a school called the New Mexico Military Institute in Roswell, um, and that was a really challenging experience for you know somebody that hadn't quite spent much time outside of the East Coast. It was a very different environment. Um, but while I was there, I, uh, you know, just kind of fell farther and farther down the technology rabbit hole that when I finally showed up to West Point, I had, I had built this Frankenstein, um, you know, RC car that was using GPS information and a microcontroller to very coarsely steer in the general direction of uh, where I was trying to get it to go. And so I brought this to 
I brought this back to to West Point after my uh, you know Thanksgiving leave, and I was playing around with it and trying to get the algorithms and the software to make it steer more sensibly. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this uh, this colonel appears over my shoulder and says, "Hey, you! What are you doing?" And I you know snapped to attention. I'm very nervous. I'd never been addressed by a colonel before in my life, so I explain what what I was doing. And the very next day, um, you know, my my uh, my curriculum changed. I was moved out of the like intro to computer science class that I was in, and I was in a more advanced class. And I just fell into, um, you know, uh, a set of mentors and, and uh, you know, instructors and guides that helped shape my, uh, my academic pursuits and ultimately my career. Violet, I love hearing that, that this kernel kind of, you know, came across you at that time and it changed the trajectory of things. Um, you know, that's, that's amazing. And he, he obviously put you in the right place. <laughs> he assigned me to this, uh, to this young captain's class, uh, Captain Sankster, who, uh, you know, years later today, he is like a uh, brigade commander of the army's, you know, 780th, uh, um, MI brigade where we oh, you know, wow. house, uh, some of our, uh, you know, brightest soldiers and, uh, um, NCOs and, and officers doing cyber operations. So it's oh, very cool. how yeah. small the community is, you know? Yeah. And did you know at an early age that you wanted to go into the military? Um, was that a clear I, path? It wasn't a clear path. No, I think I stumbled into it. Um, there wasn't any, you know, immediate military service in my, in my uh, family. I, I have, you know, some family members buried in Arlington Cemetery, but, you know, from like two or three generations ago. So my my mom understandably was a little bit uh, surprised when I came home one day and I had a flyer or something about um, you know West Point and I was like I want to go here and she's like what? <laughs> but um, my parents eventually warmed up to the idea and I was just hell bent on it. I wouldn't really consider any other outcome than going to a service academy. I have the distinct honor of being rejected by all of them though. So I didn't get into any of them the first time around, but um, something I, I like to you know, share with young people that are considering a similar path is if you just set your sights on going to a school like that, you will eventually find a way in. You know, I did a year of junior college in New Mexico, um, but there are plenty of folks that, uh, you know, they enlist and then they get into a service academy the year after. Um, or, you know, uh, you know, through that route. So if you're determined enough, you will find a way into uh, one of those schools. Right. Cause that, that's great advice. Cause I know how competitive is, it is the academies. And um, so I like kind of hearing about, you know, a different way in than just going, you know, being admitted and going um, and what, how, what was it like doing ROTC in New Mexico and, and then, and you, and you, I guess you had your goal in mind of going to West Point at that point, or yeah, yeah, okay. Can you talk yeah, about so, a little bit about that? So the ROTC experience at at uh, at NIMI in New Mexico, it was it was different. It was unique. Um, you know, it's a it's a fascinating school out there. Um, first off, you know, for a guy from like the DC suburbs, Roswell, New Mexico, is like the definition of the middle of nowhere. You know, it was very scary showing up. I had never flown across the country without like my family before. They just dropped me off at Dulles Airport, kind of waved and, you know, we're probably laughing on their way back to the car. Like we got one out of the house, you know, and he can't come back because uh, it was a military school. So I remember, um, you know, this like four hour drive from Albuquerque getting there, but it was a gorgeous campus, incredible people. Um, you know, there's discipline, you have to wear a uniform, but the academics were were phenomenal. Um, and and West Point, you know, of course, is is really taking all of that, uh, you know, just to kind of like the, the national level. It was, um, NIMI was an amazing preparatory opportunity for me. And, um, and to be able to experience ROTC and the service academy uh, preparation and see the similarities um, certainly gave me an appreciation for the uh, you know, the unique, I guess, experiences that each uh, gets to offer the prospective officer community. And um, and I, I realize now how stronger the military is to be able to draw on an officer corps that comes up from these, you know, different commissioning paths, um, either OCS, you know, the direct commissioning school, or ROTC, or a service academy path. 
Right, sure. And before you, um, you know, were kind of a founding member of U.S. Cyber Command, can you talk about kind of the period before that, a couple of years where you'd come out of West Point with these cyber and computer science skills? Um, what was it like in those early years before Cyber Command and what, kind of what, what were you doing? Yeah, so after you commissioned from a service academy, right, you uh, you have to go to a basic officer course. In the Army, they send you to a, a different installation depending on what branch you're in. So I had decided to uh, try my hand at the infantry for a few years. And so I went to Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, this is a storied institution where literally, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of people have you know, come before me. It's the home to the airborne school and the infantry school. And, uh, you know, you, you, you spend a lot of time outdoors, um, learning, you know, uh, going on patrols and, and going to the range and learning how to operate all of these different weapons and learning how to, uh, lead, you know, small units. Um, most importantly, I learned to keep my mouth shut and listen to my non-commissioned officers, uh, which is what I tried to do when I've showed up to my first unit at, at Fort Hood after that year of, of training um, at Benning. I did infantry school, airborne school, or sorry, infantry school, ranger school, then airborne school, a little out of order there, um, and a Bradley uh, familiarization course on the fighting vehicle there. So when I got to Fort Hood, um, I was assigned a platoon within uh, you know a day or two. And it's, it's just amazing how the military empowers uh, young people with, you know, some training, but, you know, relatively little to no experience um, from such a young age. And so, uh, you know, the the first like six months being a platoon leader, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, you're still learning who you are and uh, your leadership style, but you're being mentored by these very experienced non-commissioned officers that um, in my case, just kept throwing books my way. Like, all right, you want to understand how this works? Like read this and then come out to the motor pool and we'll show you how it's really done. And so uh, that early foundation um, really set me up for success uh, later in my career. I was very fortunate for all that. Right. Yeah. It is, it is interesting that you had that kind of infantry experience before kind of going into cyber and the digital realm. Um yeah, and then can you talk about what it was like to help stand up Army Cyber Command and kind of what was what was the atmosphere like then and how did that all come about, I guess, from your perspective? So I think the first thing that was important for me to learn and appreciate was that, you know, the military had been doing cyber operations for many, many years before. So there was experience and know-how and, you know, procedures and doctrine that had already been figured out. Additionally, I was assigned up to Fort Meade. I was assigned to the 780th MI, uh, 780th MI Brigade and the 781st MI Battalion. And, you know, they were larger uh, rebirths of prior organizations that had existed and had been doing this mission for some time. So um, all of that said, there was, you know, there was energy and a buzz about building out and expanding the cyber mission forces. And there was a mandate to train and equip, you know, uh, many, many, many units, over 200 of these, you know, mission teams and support teams and protection teams across the services, across DOD. Um, and so there was a, a large emphasis on getting people through training pipelines, getting people organized, um, you know, conducting exercises on knowledge management, transfer. Um, I think still to this day, while the force has matured and it is at a certain level of readiness, that culture of, um, you know, figuring things out and sharing your insights uh, with your peers to your left and right and finding new innovative ways of meeting commander's intent uh, is still very well alive and well. And I don't see that changing because the technology moves so quickly. I think it's a fascinating and exciting space to be in. Right, sure. And then you are also instrumental in having DOD conduct cybersecurity assessments of weapon systems. Um, and I know for the Air Force, I've kind of reported on this, but kind of, you know, seeing it, you know, recently. But I can't imagine that they, there was a time where that really wasn't needed. Can you talk about that? And kind of yeah. your role? So yeah. When we, when we think of like some of the stable 
bread and butter weapon systems that the department and the services have relied on for decades, right? Let's talk Army specifically. You know, people think of like the Abrams tank, the Apache attack helicopter, the Chinook, and the Black Hawk utility helicopters. Um, you know, these systems were originally designed uh, decades ago, right? 60s, 70s, 80s, and they've been modernized, um, you know, consistently since then. But uh, they were originally designed in their, in their initial requirements that gave way to, uh, you know, to their, uh, their production. They emerged in an era before, um, you know, uh, this thought that we were living in a contested cyber uh, environment. And so as they were modified and block upgraded and more and more computers were shoved into them and they became, uh, you know, more increasingly sophisticated and capable uh, machines in the communication and lethality perspective, um, you know, we we realized, I think, a little later in the game that, like, wait a second, there's so much, there's so many computers, there's so much code involved here. Uh, we really want to understand what is the cyber protection, what is the cyber risk that we're carrying into the battlefield, and how could adversaries that would choose to employ hybrid or asymmetric, uh, you know, techniques against us use the very things that make these such capable and advantageous machines, use that against us. So, um, you know, the GAO published this report in 2018 uh, that really well summarizes the topic um, uh, very, very well at the unclassified level that I encourage people to read. There's a one page executive summary and like it's a 60 page document and they outline all of these general learnings that we've uh, appreciated um, after years and years of assessment study of weapon systems. Um, each of the services has had a red team looking at this problem periodically uh, for many years prior, but I think there were a series of aha moments and demonstrations that the uh, that different you know members of the various military services did kind of mid last uh, last decade and, that gave rise to a whole new appreciation for the problem and uh, legislation and resources from Congress to uh, to do something about it. So, um, you know, now I think the Department of Defense leads the world actually in understanding its cyber operational technology risk and in developing and implementing technologies to mitigate it. And I think that the nation will benefit from this in other critical infrastructure verticals like transportation and uh, you know utilities, um, you know where today we we don't have uh, the right sensors, the right monitoring, or the right protection uh, solutions employed. Right, sure. And I wanted to pick your brain one about one more thing related to your Army Cyber Days. Um, what is Army Cyber Solutions development capability? Kind of you know what is that, and why CFD. was that important? Yeah, so um, so when I first joined uh, the cyber branch, there wasn't like a, a dedicated unit that would do capability development, uh, but this was pretty quickly appreciated as a as a need. Um, you know, generally the military buys capabilities, material solutions, you know, you name it from from industry, and they have this process where they you know publish a request for information and then they develop requirements and they publish a request for proposal and um, and it can be a lengthy process and it's it's geared toward building um, you know very complex things like aircraft carriers or fighter jets um, or buying uh, you know many of a thing you know think like uniform tops or boots. Uh, where you need to buy and scale, you know, production to, you know, tens of thousands to millions of articles of, of a thing. Um, so quickly we realized in cyber that, you know, the operational pace was just so much faster than you could develop requirements and go out to industry and say, hey, can I have a capability to, um, you know, develop this type of access? or provide this type of effect on this particular piece of software or operating system or whatever. There was a need for something faster. Um, and we realized that we had the right human capital already within the formation to do that. We just needed to organize them. So, uh, you know, the other services had successfully 
organize their own, uh, you know, capability development activities. And, um, and so I was uh, fortunate to play a small role in helping stand up that first, uh, first army, um, you know, element or unit to, uh, uh, to bring those capabilities to the cyber force. Yeah, that's very cool. Very cool. And then when you finally were ready to leave the service and leave active duty, kind of how did you know, I guess, when you wanted to do that? And then how did you manage that transition for and any advice for anybody kind of looking at that? Yeah. So first, you know, I, I, I feel very driven and compelled by the national security mission. And um, there are a couple different ways that you can serve that. You know, I served that in uniform for some time. And uh, I realized that I wanted to tackle a problem that couldn't be solved in a single PCS cycle. You know, the, the military rotates its people for very good reasons around to different assignments and different, uh, you know, locations around the planet every, you know, two to five years. And I wanted to tackle a problem that required um, focus, that required uh, the ability to, to you know, build a, a team, and honestly, that could be better accomplished in industry than in the service. So um, after coming to that very hard realization, I had a series of discussions with uh, with my mentors and, and my senior leadership, and I explained to them why I wanted to leave and how this was going to be accretive to the national mission. And so I eventually earned their, uh, <laughs> their, 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 uh, their blessing uh, which was really important to me as I was leaving. Um, but, you know, I would say that I don't think my uh, my service to the nation's over. I'm certainly serving in a different capacity now, you know, as a as a vendor and a, you know, contractor, you know, supporting industry, but, um, you know, somewhere down the road, um, I might be able to serve in a different capacity. So uh, that's, that's how I kind of look at all that. The transition, you know, candidly from military service to industry was, challenging um in some ways um and and candidly liberating in others so you you know you have more you, you enjoy more freedoms and autonomy of course you know i i uh, i still have to ask permission if i'm going to go overseas you know on vacation but i i get more freedom to set the dates and uh and kind of work my my own schedule um it was bittersweet and uh Fortunately, there are a number of organizations and a whole network of people that help, uh, you know, veterans through their transition process. And I took full advantage of that, and I encourage others to as well. Um, there's tremendous opportunity for, uh, you know, for veterans in the workforce whenever their service time um, uh, in uniform is up. So, yeah. Right, yeah, absolutely. And then now, tell us about your entrepreneurial role and your company. Um, kind of what you're doing and the company's mission. Yeah. So as I, whenever I figured out this path that I, you know, needed to leave to solve this problem, I kind of looked around and I identified a few other officers that intimately understood this problem and that were on the same kind of timeline and had the same vision. Uh, and so my co-founders, you know, Josh uh, Laspinoso and James Karenny joined me in this endeavor. Um, and that was helpful too, right? Because there was, there were three of us embarking on, um, on this uh, path, but we, uh, you know, we, we all just kind of not so kiddingly joked one day, we we're like, yeah, we'll just start a company and solve this problem on the outside. And I never could have appreciated how hard a journey that was going to be, um, you know, stepping off from the military and, and building and scaling a company to uh, put hardware and software on, you know, fleet assets like commercial airliners and locomotives and fighter jets. Um, it's the hardest, but the most rewarding thing that I've ever engaged in. When we started, uh, you know, I, I left the military. I got my uh, my discharge paperwork, and I drove immediately from Fort Meade, where I left, to our offices um, here in Roslyn, where we were renting a single, effectively cubicle. The three of us were just jammed in there. <laughs> so, you know, three people and a, a plush dog. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and we got started and, and really never looked back. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've been through all of these trials and, and tribulations as a company and have helped, uh, you know, have, have managed to scale it from, you know, those three people to a hundred and growing at just tremendous year over year, uh, uh, you know, growth across a variety of different metrics. But what's been most rewarding has been able, you know, has been the ability to uh, really take a vision, 
develop a product, both hardware and software, um, communicate that vision, build a world-class team, and uh, actually get this product out into the world where it's solving real issues. It's you know increasing safety and security and survivability of platforms, but also liberating data off of these platforms so that we can solve other problems like maintenance and operational readiness issues. Um, so through the course of all of that, we've kind of uh, you know reimagined the company as not just a cybersecurity company, but as a data company. And uh, that's been another incredible part of the journey is, you know, you set off uh, seeking to do one thing, but there are all of these influences, um, you know, that get to shape that journey. And so success is not a straight line and, uh, and you end up doing something that, um, you know, I, I just don't think that we could have imagined where we would have landed up, landed. All right, sure. And then I wanted to ask, kind of given your perspective in the private sector, kind of how companies can get their prototype or emerging technology through the valley of death. You know, more and more these days, technology, especially emerging and advanced technologies is coming from the private sector. Um, and I, Signal Magazine is tackling this issue in July and you're, you put in an article for that. Um, can you talk about that from your perspective? How do, you know, how do, how does, how do companies get, you know, through that tech, technology readiness scale, you know, without help or with help? How do you how do you navigate that? I guess. Well, first, I'd like to say humbly that I think we're still figuring that out at Shift Five, um, and it's uh, this is a very very challenging topic. There are aspects of policy involved here. There's a lot of aspects of law that actually influence, um, you know, the operating environment. So my first piece of advice to uh, you know, entrepreneurs that are um, taking this challenge um, upon themselves is, uh, is first off, don't give up. Second, uh, understand the requirements, the Department of Defense's requirements that you are addressing and learn the requirements process, how those requirements are developed, shaped, modified, and communicated to industry. That is really, really important. And um, and then, you know, seek out and find, uh, you know, the, the unique mechanisms that the department has and is, is seeking to, um, I think, empower or expand um, to transition from research development, test and engineering activities into, uh, you know, production, low rate and full rate production activities. Um, this is a tough thing to do, but I think it has the senior leader's attention. I've heard recently uh, Honorable uh, Heidi Shu, the uh, you know Assistant Secretary for Research and Engineering, and her um, her peer, Dr. Laplante, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Acquisitions and Sustainment. They've both spoken about programs, initiatives, funding, uh, you know, policy changes that they're um, actually implementing, and how the department is tracking. Uh, you know, companies across this uh, Valley of Death transition. Um, I'll echo something that uh, that Dr. Laplante said recently that I think is really important context. So after the Berlin Wall fell and the, um, you know, the, the Cold War ended, the country, you know, took a, a set of deliberate steps to capitalize on a peace dividend. And we encouraged consolidation and, and mergers across the defense industrial base. Um, those steps were taken, uh, you know, with the right intentions and, uh, and with the right, you know, background research. Um, and they yielded incredible, uh, you know, results and, and dividends back to the American taxpayer. But now we find ourselves in a different world, uh, you know, one where we need to expand the military industrial base because it's become too fragile. There are too few suppliers of um, existing key technologies like uh, munitions, uh, energetics, right? The solid rocket motors that make you know things go. Um, and we're in this technology arms race uh, you know with other uh, you know peer adversaries, right? So the ability to inject uh, new companies, technologies into uh, you know, into DOD and actually feel them has never been higher. And, and that's, I think, the necessary background and context to why this valley of death problem is so 
is such an issue and, and is actually receiving a lot of, uh, you know, key attention. Um, you know, I just continue to encourage uh, people to seek out the programs that provide transformative eight-figure production contracts for those companies that demonstrate the ability to scale. Uh, they're out there, and you can always make your case as well, um, you know, through, uh, you know, formal channels. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll just come, you know, come full circle and just say, you know, don't give up. Uh, continue to engage, uh, learn and become expert on the policies and the systems in the background, and uh, you'll eventually find a path across. Right. Yeah, that's great advice. And then I definitely wanted to say congratulations as you're rec being recognized as an Axia 40 under 40. Um, I, I can see why they selected you. That's really terrific. Kimberly, I appreciate that. I think that was somebody in my office putting me up to, uh -huh. to just work harder. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh -huh. any kind of acknowledgement like this at the end of the day, I think is uh, it's really important for, uh, you know, for the families of, of my, you know, not only mine, but the other uh, winners. Um, it, uh, it, it meant a lot to my mom and to my wife. They, they were like, oh, we, we, I think we understand what you do. <laughs> Aww, it yeah. was great. It was great to be able to show them that and thank them for everything that, uh, you know, the people around me do to, to support me and this team as we, uh, you know, work to achieve our goals. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a nice perspective. Um, and then, you know, as an emerging now recognized emerging leader, uh, what advice would you give to young people, those in high school, college, and then also, you know, young professionals? Yeah. Wow. Um, so I still consider myself a young person. So this is a little, awkward. I know the gray hair is really right. coming now, but uh, <laughs> it's funny to be asked that question because um, I feel like I'm still reinventing myself and figuring it all out. But I, I would just say, um, you know, be fearless. Uh, when you're younger, um, you have less responsibilities. And before you have a mortgage and, you know, children, like you can take bigger and riskier bets. So be fearless, go out, build something, find the people that you can solve problems for and ask them to describe those problems and then iterate with them and bring solutions, uh, you know, to bear to those problems. And you would be surprised, shocked, um, what you can do. And, uh, you know, I think that what holds many back that otherwise would be entrepreneurs or, uh, you know, radical engineers helping, you know, build the technologies that are going to make the world a better place is that, uh, you know, they're just kind of afraid to take a step out. Um, the reality is that anybody successful has stepped on so many landmines, um, you know, that, uh, you know, experience and, and wisdom really is just the culmination of, uh, you know, making mistakes and just failing forward over and over and over again. And so my, my advice would be fe be fearless, um, have grit, know that it's going to be hard, but embrace that and just go out there and, and do a thing, um, do a thing today, you know, don't, don't wait for next week or next year. Um, it's easier, uh, you know, when, when you're younger and once you, as you, as you build that muscle memory, as you build that energy, as you build that experience, um, you know, increasingly exciting opportunities open up to you. So, uh, yeah, just go out there and seize the world, um, you know, by the horns and get after it. That's what I would suggest. Right. Love that. Love that. And then to, you know, leaders of an older generation, um, you know, what perspective can you offer from your generation and what advice do you have to them to maybe understand, um, you know, your perspective, I guess. So I think um, I, I, I hear a lot uh, among my, my older, uh, you know, mentors, um, you know, concern about the new generation and, uh, to be blunt, you know, like our, our work ethic, um, you know, and I would say that, uh, you know, give, give young people a chance. I think that you would be surprised and shocked, um, how much energy and enthusiasm and uh, genuine concern, uh, you know, there is to make a mark on the world. I think every generation has, um, you know, been shaped by different, 
uh, you know, world events. And, uh, you know, certainly my, the, you know, my first 35 years of experience on this planet has been, uh, uh, you know, pretty, pretty wild major events. Um, you know, the pandemic is something I, I think we'll all live with, uh, you know, going forward and, and building a company in the midst of that has shaped a lot of my opinions about, you know, how we work and collaborate effectively with one another. So, um, you know, I would just say, uh, you know, please continue to do, continue to reach out and mentor, uh, you know, those that you think you can create the biggest impact in, uh, because, um, I've received so much advice and, uh, you know, coaching from those that have been around the track many times, uh, more than I have. And, uh, as soon as I show them that I'm willing to put the work in and, and they give me, uh, you know, those tips and get and guidance and, and point me in the right direction. Um, I feel supercharged. I feel like I'm able to make good on, on their vision and on their, uh, you know, uh, objectives that, you know, at, at the end of the day that we're all, you know, kind of tracking towards. So, um, yeah, please continue to, uh, you know, just mentor and guide, uh, those, those younger and, and don't write off, I think the newer generations for, um, you know, being, uh, you know, too lazy or too heavily influenced by, uh, you know, social media or, you know, whatever the criticism may be, I think that you would be surprised. Um, just as I'm sure if they can rewind the clock, they would feel that they were surprising those before them decades ago. Right. Yeah. 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 Look past those stereotypes. Yeah. That's good. And anything else you wanted to share or highlight? Kimberly, I, I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity. I think, you know, AFSIA is a, an incredible organization that brings together, uh, you know, people that are focused on some really exciting uh, missions. Um, going to FCA events has given me an opportunity to engage with, uh, you know, technology and policy leaders um, across, uh, you know, across the spectrum of defense. And uh, I found that the organization and its events have been really helpful in building my own network. And that networking has been really important for, you know, identifying new problems and aligning, you know, emerging technology or some novel solutions to those problems. So I just want to thank you and the staff for everything that you guys do. Oh, well, thank you. And I'll, I'll pass that on to the rest of FCA. Um, it is a wonderful place to work. And even though I'm kind of on the reporting side, it's it's got a great mission. And it's fascinating to see emerging technologies in the industry coming together and how it's, you know, shaping the military's capabilities. It's it's quite an exciting time, I think, now that we're past the pandemic, you know, and, and growing. Um, and uh, Mike, thanks so much. It was just, I was so excited when I learned that I could speak with you and especially given your history and your contribution in cyber and to the country and in the army. Um, and, and I'll be watching Shift F5, Shift 5 and uh, to see kind of where you guys go and, and wish you all the best. Thank you, Kimberly. It's been an honor. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Great.